Problems with model steam engine reversing valve gear. This is part two. With the fixed pair of eccentric sheaves it was not possible to achieve good valve timing in both forward and reverse directions. I made the eccentric sheaves individually adjustable but with this particular design of reversing gear there is still one more variable that is easily overlooked. In this clip I am showing the ideal slide valve setting as I rotate the crankshaft the slide valve opens the ports equally at both ends. This is with the reversing lever at the top. When I move the reversing lever to the bottom, have a look what happens to the valve timing. The slide valve is clearly not in the right position. The outer eccentric, the one with the grub screw in it, is set so that the highest lobe of the eccentric is at 90 degrees to the crank pin. And because both of the eccentrics are pinned together, I cannot set them individually. As the timing seems to be very correct, with the reversing lever at the top, I'm going to give it a run. That really is as good as it gets. The timing is set to perfection. Now I need to investigate why it doesn't work on the other eccentric. Here I'm disconnecting the eccentrics from the expansion link. And once again, the eccentrics are proving very difficult to pull away from the crankshaft. That's due to the grub screw raising a burr on the crankshaft. Here's the first pair of eccentrics. They're still pinned together. I've just opened them up so you can see them in detail. The pins that secure the eccentric sheaves together were just a push fit, so it was very easy to separate them. And here they are, dismantled on the bench. I'm pretty sure that my brain is not right. For instance, yesterday, my first wife and I went into a pharmacy for our annual flu vaccination. We were both sat in this side room inside the pharmacy and this man stuck needles in our arms. And while I watched the man stick the needle in my first wife's arm, I thought to myself, this is a really good job for a serial killer. You can stab people all day and get away with it. That's enough of the way my brain works. It's time to drill some holes in the eccentric sheaves using a centre drill to start with so that the hole is exactly in the centre, followed by using a tapping size twist drill so I can thread both of the holes 6BA. And here they are, and you can see the holes really are in the centre of the grooves. Making sure the holes are in the centre is quite important, I'll show you why shortly. Time now to carefully thread these holes using a 6BA tap. I dropped a blob of lubricating oil onto the bench so I can lubricate the tap. These eccentric sheaves are made from steel and more difficult to thread than the normal cast iron type. I'm using this excellent small vise that I bought a while back. It's really useful for jobs like this. If the eccentric sheave was made from cast iron, I wouldn't have to do this. I could hold it in my hand. But in any case, this is a much better way of doing it. I can see at all times that the tap is going into the hole squarely. Be very careful when you're threading steel parts using small taps. They will break very easily. And don't forget to frequently back off the tap to clear all the chippings. This one needed backing off every three quarters of a turn. Over the years I've broken a few small taps and it's usually when I've been winding it out because I've gone in too far and the chips have blocked the flutes on the tap. After the threading job was completed I fitted a grub screw. It's a long grub screw but it can't be too long, it needs to clear the groove. The drilling and threading operation had created a burr on the inside of the eccentric sheave. Here I'm removing it with a 930 seconds of an inch reamer. Now I can put everything back together and see what happens. Here I'm temporarily removing the pinch bolt because I need to use this hole in the eccentric strap for my allen key to adjust the grub screw. I will demonstrate. Yes, it fits in there perfectly and I can move the grub screw in and out. Here everything's attached to the engine and I'm using the Allen key to adjust the inner eccentric. Initially, I set this eccentric to 90 degrees to the crank pin, but the opposite side to the first eccentric. Time for some compressed air. Is it going to work? Well, at least it's trying. After making some adjustments to the inside eccentric, things started to get a little bit better. And after a few more adjustments, this happened. This was encouraging, but still not right. 
When I moved the lever down to the bottom, look what happened. This is how the engine should run with the valve gear at both ends. Also, the position of this second eccentric relative to the first eccentric should be about the same. Occasionally, the eccentric setting allows for some lead, but not as much as this. Right, I'm going to stop messing about and show you what the problem is. Common problems with reversing valve gear. And this problem is deceptively simple. This Stuart 10V is part of a steam plant that I'm building for a customer, and in the series Making a Stuart Model Steam Plant, I did mention that there weren't any instructions for the assembly of this valve gear. For it to work, two of the eccentric rods need to be cranked over, and I automatically assumed that the straight eccentric rod just screwed into the eccentric, and initially I screwed this stud all the way into the eccentric strap. But unfortunately, that is not right. The straight rod has to be screwed out of the eccentric strap to make it the same length as the cranked over rod. I would have thought this would have been built into the kit's design. In this clip I'm showing how much you need to screw out the straight rod. Before starting to assemble the valve gear, I checked all the lengths of the components, particularly the studs, to make sure I had the right ones. Here I'm using a steel rule to illustrate the length. It needs to be 7 eighths of an inch, from the bottom of the fork to the top of the eccentric strap. And as you can see from this clip, that's more or less the required dimension. Once I put the engine back together and set the eccentrics, it was time for an air test. And I'm sure you will agree this is how it should be. In this clip you can see there's a bit of flywheel run out, that's because the bearings are loose. When I'm working on certain aspects of steam engines, I do slacken off the bearings. It just makes the engine easier to turn over. I'll tighten them when I've finished the job. Time now for a bit of obsessive tweaking of the eccentric. This one's okay, the other one underneath is a bit more fiddly, but it has to be done. Don't forget this engine is currently only running one cylinder at a time. I checked both ends and now it runs very well and it's time to connect up the cylinders. Some customers make comments such as, why do you run the engine so fast? Steam engines shouldn't run that fast, which is not strictly true. The answer is, I run them this fast to see if anything goes wrong with them, and as it turned out, something went wrong with this one. I'll cover it in the next episode. That's it for now. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.